Hello and let's talk about the Prime Minister's speech to the country yesterday. Mr. Modi was everywhere at 8 p.m. again yesterday, talking about the value of self-reliance, the crisis being an opportunity for India, and proposing a large financial package, the details of which will be announced today. The other major announcement was regarding lockdown 4.0, the details of which will again be announced later. All in all, it was a speech with a lot of leads, but no real clarity, especially when many Indians are worried about what happens next. We know that the lockdown is being eased, but there seems to be no real flattening of the curve yet. So how is the government planning to deal with this issue? We'll discuss this, but first here are some details. As of 8 a.m. today morning, the total number of COVID-19 cases in India was 74,281, with 47,480 active cases. The total number of deaths stands at 2,415. Yesterday, 3,525 new cases were reported with 122 deaths. So far, over 1.85 million tests have been conducted. The highest number of active cases is in Maharashtra, followed by Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. Prime Minister Modi announced that Rs 20 lakh crores would be spent for, to address the fallout of COVID-19. He pointed out that this is 10% of the country's GDP, a point which was widely celebrated by his supporters on social media. However, this amount includes a liquidity injected by the RBI into the system and previous financial package. The Indian Express says that the total amount spent by the government this year in fresh allotments may be only over 4 lakh crores. The concrete details will be announced by Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman at 4 p.m. today. 12.2 crore jobs have been lost due to the impact of the coronavirus in April. We talked to NewsClick's Prabir Purkayasa on this issue. Thank you, Prabir, so much for joining us. The Prime Minister delivered his speech yesterday. He announced this financial package, which the numbers are big, but there's been a lot of debate about whether it's actually, actually going to be worth that much. And more importantly, there seems to be no real clarity about how the country is going to handle the disease, with the, especially with the rising number of cases. So before we go to some of the detail, details, do you think that the government is kind of struggling without a strategy right now? Well, let's put it this way. Government has a, had really one strategy for the uh, coronavirus, novel coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infections, which was a lockdown. Okay. So th apart from that, the whole understanding of the epidemic that this was going to be with us for quite some time this could give us the lockdown could give us a breathing space within which we had to really create the necessary infrastructure for a long-term engagement with the epidemic which as we have said a number of times in our shows and also with other experts we have had that meant follow-up testing contact tracing isolating the people who are infected and looking after your health system because the secondary source of the infections today are again the hospitals because if we don't provide protective equipment to them they will be infected they will infect others and of course they will infect the patients as well as their colleagues all of that we are seeing and even today the hospital scene seems to be quite poor right. and that means that your frontline workers who are struggling to contain the disease get taken out the contact tracing, all of this is again very, relatively weak and the testing numbers are not going up. If we look at Wuhan today, the Chinese are saying they're going to test in 10 days the whole city of Wuhan, 10 million people, 11 million people. 1 million tests per day just for one city. And we are struggling at the moment something like 60, 70, 100,000 tests. If we can do that per week, so if you take the tests that we are doing, at the moment, we are around the 100,000 mark if we give the government some credit. But the point is that this is not nearly enough. And we need much more testing today than what we are doing. If we don't do that, then we will really not identify where are the clusters, where are the people who are the new foci of infections. So the cycle of new infections will keep on continuing. Lockdown breaks that chains of transmission by breaking a lot of those links, but doesn't end it. And right. even under lockdown, we are talking of reproductive rates of 1.21 or so, which roughly translates to about 8%, 9% rise per day, which is what we are seeing. Mm -hmm. And at that rate, we will still double in about 10 to 11 days. Now that is still not containing the epidemic. It's a slow growth of the epidemic. And when you lift the lockouts or lockdowns, obviously the numbers will only increase. Right. So 
the fact that we did not use the lockdown to put all these things in place is now visible and we will we'll probably see now rising numbers. If we look at the basic figures also, you will see that really it's 10 to 12 hotspots that are providing the largest numbers. So that would have been the focus that we should have seen. And we should have also seen much more cooperation of the state governments. Even now, the central government, even as late as yesterday, the directions to the states were, was, okay, you can give your suggestions, but we will issue the notifications. So the entire centralization of handling this epidemic still continues. This cannot be handled unless it's also decentralized. Central planning, central policies, central supplies, central planning for finances, particularly money being given. But at the same time, it has to be implemented at the state and local level. And that's what is missing. Also missing, of course, is people's participation. They are supposed to be locked down at the most clap, but that's about it. There is nothing more that they can or should do. So the people's participation is also the missing element here because all they're being asked to do is to basically stay, stay locked down, follow instructions and clap. There is no participation in the community in how they can contribute to combating the epidemic. And all these measures, if they're not taken, a centralized top-down approach, which is what is being followed, is not likely to bear fruit. And also the fact that it is entirely, as we have commented earlier, a police come centralized approach. That is, that is what is being implemented. And it doesn't really help in helping us in this particular phase of the epidemic. Right. And the other key question is regarding the steps for the economic package as well. So Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman is scheduled to announce the details today evening at 4 o'clock. But it's nonetheless, first of all, it is surprising that the government is, did not decide that ahead of the Prime Minister's speech. Nothing was announced. And already it is quite too late for a lot of steps because a lot of the economic impact has already been seen in very harsh ways. You can see that there is 122 million Indians who have lost their jobs. This is CMI figures who normally are touted on the front page of most papers when anything positive comes out. But when it's the workers who are losing jobs, it has sort of been written off the front pages. Now, the US job losses are still big news, but Indian job losses are not. Now, the, if you look at the package that is being announced, it seems to focus primarily on giving liquidity to business houses. That's the intent of it. Yes, there are talks about the farmers, the migrant workers, the poor, how transfers will be made, the Jandhan Yojana. We'll have to see how much it translates in terms of actual money transfers. But what has been the slow, the uh, demand of a lot of the opposition parties, including the left, that the Manrega program now needs to be upped so that that provides a support to the unemployed or the people, particularly in rural areas. <laughs> But you know, the Manrega has not been to the liking of the capitalist class because it acts as a wage push that it sort of gives the floor of wages that you can offer. And obviously with the current mood of the government, which is labor reforms, and that again, Modi did talk about it yesterday, the laws, labor, all of this, if you see the directives that are being issued by the state governments, that labor laws can be dispensed with, we can have now 14 hour week, 14 hour day, right. we can do away with higher and you know, any protection to the workers, simple hire and fire. So handing over the workers completely to the capitalist class. But the biggest issue for me, apart from that, which has been the policy of the central and the BJP governments for a long time, it is the fact that they don't respect the constitutional guarantees to the workers. That's only one part of it. What they're also not seeing is that when Modi talks about demand, where is the demand going to be right. if you up the working hours for the workers, which means less employment, less employment also means less demand. So all of this is essentially in the name of labor reform. What you're going to see is what is already in the offing as has already been announced by the state government. Right. Do away with the protection to the workers and hand them over completely to the 
those who run the companies. No. Also, this talk about 14 hour, 12 hour days, this is medieval. This is not a wage slavery. This is really slavery. And we saw an indication of that with the Bangalore construction industry didn't want the workers to leave. Right. They wanted essentially bonded labor. That's, that was the demand that was being made. Exactly. And finally, to focus on one of the Prime Minister's pet themes, which is about self-reliance in handling, in dealing with this disease. So, do you think India has actually been able to tap into any of these resources when it comes to addressing COVID-19 or is it just another slogan? Well, let's put it this way. We are producing masks and we anyway are the global pharmacy for the poor. So, we do produce a lot of formulations, particularly what are called generic drugs. So that level of self-reliance we always did have, our textile industry and other, you know, this level of industry were always effective. I, I think we'd like to analyze the self-reliance bit a little more. This is not the Nehruvian self-reliance, which means that you also develop the human capability, the knowledge base and the people who then understand what is being transferred to as technology. This self-reliance means what Modi said yesterday, supply chain locate industries here. And of course, we have invited now Apple, who want to transfer a part of the supply chain out of China. And we are hoping more such co companies will follow suit. We have offered them concessions in India to really open their companies. So essentially, what we are seeing is this self-reliance means essentially transfer companies out from other countries here. Bring your production facilities either at home or in China to India and we'll provide you land and as you are now saying, bonded labor as well. So this is the one part of the self-reliance which is different from the Nehruvian self-reliance that we talked about post 47, which had a national consensus behind it. So that's one element of the self-reliance. But one must also not forget that the global supply chain problems have now become clear that you also need local supplies because if anything disrupts the global supply chain, countries are then really scrambling how to beat their whatever demands are. And this time it was hospital demands. But leaving that out, there's one interesting development we must say, at least government has started thinking about in, you know, providing for the local industry, providing for the local demand, building local, local supply chains. That is better than thinking that only outsourcing your software people, outsourcing what is called the call services industry, that you take phone calls and that becomes your uh, way of life as it were. So you can see that that at least is a welcome change. And particularly in the military affairs, it's a very important change because earlier we are talking of interoperability with the NATO forces interoperability with the United States, which means that we were tying ourselves to the supply chain originating from the United States. And that was the substance of what the uh, defense agreements were between India and the United States. Vipin Rawat had had a, a three day back, a two day back here at the press conference. He talked about all, a lot of this. And Bhattu Kumar has written a detailed piece on the implication of Rawat's statement. So I think one element is India will have to think about not banking or not becoming an adjunct to the American war industry or becoming relatively independent. And if it does, then developing local technologies, local capabilities, importing technology, but not tying yourself completely to them and absorbing the technology. This is going to be the battle on self-reliance. Otherwise, there is a very telling picture somebody has put up, self and reliance. This is an old joke which was there for the always for the monies. That when, when you talk about self-reliance, it's about self and reliance. Thank you so much, Prabir, for talking to us. In our next segment, we go to Tamil Nadu, where women workers speak about the issues they're facing due to the COVID-19 crisis. Contribution of working women in India to the social and economic growth is immense. Amid the period of novel coronavirus and the lockdown, majority of the women workers have been affected. Notably, Tamil Nadu has been in the top in terms of number of working women. 
we will look into how working women have been affected these days romba kashta sulnala karam it is a difficult situation and we are struggling to get food we are not earning anything and even our employers are not helping us in any way rupees 1000 is not enough for us government should consider us and our livelihood naanga sipkart la vela seiyren i'm working in sipkart last month i had worked for 20 days and was given rupees 7000 as my salary but i can't run my family with that salary this month i haven't yet gotten my salary this novel corona virus is torturing us and we don't know what to do the situation um that we are having today is almost like we are going to be talking of before corona virus and after corona virus so in that kind of a situation how were women workers before now after corona virus how are women now so before the corona virus pandemic came and our country was responding to it women were did not have much support but they were going out to work they had a job Uh, they did not have time to think because as you know in india women are working for more than 5 hours only in unpaid care work the difference between men and women in unpaid care work is huge men are working only for 52 minutes in a day for unpaid care work whereas women are working for 5 hours so even though the stress on them for more work with their families is as also going out to work for a wage the burden on women has always been more and they have basically more than double burden that is the home and work but they also have other burdens which are caused because of their low caste status because of their stigma in the workplace that they don't like to say oh i'm working as a velakari or domestic worker or even a garment factory worker for that matter there is a stigma attached that they are not uh, that they may be having a relationship outside so their personal life is em- embedded and meshed into this and the burdens of work were always there so now after corona what happened the crisis is that the women lost their jobs uh they have no income even the domestic worker the worker who the woman worker who is sitting is selling her uh some vegetables in the marketplace or who is selling um let us say uh some small small things in the local market or fish or whatever they are doing to make a small living they have all lost their jobs actually after corona will they be able to recover that we know for a fact that the government of india uh made a blanket lockdown that means no fishing no agriculture no transport no domestic work no services everything is shut down this is completely unprecedented that means 130 crore people are supposed to not do anything now when they don't do anything how do they feed themselves can a country which has so many uh people who are not even paid minimum wage who have no security who have no savings be just asked to sit at home That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news developments of the day. Until then, keep watching News Clip.